Parkour and weightlifting have somewhat of a muddy history. In the old dark forum days, it had a pretty terrible reputation. People looked down on it as something that regular sports did. Who needed deadlifts when you had bodyweight squats and endless stair quadrupedal? But fortunately, the dark ages are behind us and flips are allowed and after some early adopters, weightlifting too. And nowadays, more and more well-known athletes post and talk about their weight training for parkour performance. And this generally has led to much wider adoption within the general parkour community, with some philosophies even viewing it as a necessity, with phrases like, get as much weight on the bar as soon as possible being thrown around. But how necessary is it really? And what does it actually achieve? Are there risks associated with it? Really, in this video, I'm going to answer the question, should you or shouldn't you weight train for parkour performance? And for this video, I'm bracing for a little controversy because I know some people hold some pretty strong opinions about this topic. So try and keep an open mind on this one. To begin, we need to think long and hard about what weight training actually does. We're adding load to an existing movement pattern. It then, over time, makes this pattern of movement and the muscles you're using to do it stronger, assuming that you're following a strength training program. And at first glance, this kind of sounds ideal for parkour. The logic is something like, squats are like jumping, I'll do squats, I'll get stronger at squats, and then my jumps will get bigger. And honestly, if you do that, you probably will get that outcome. So no problem, right? Unfortunately, yes, one or two problem. Weightlifting doesn't really care which pattern it makes stronger. It'll just take whatever pattern you brought in and improve that. So if you have really good movement patterns, as in you're in the top 1% for whatever movement it is you're training, the story almost ends there. Do some weight training, get stronger, get some bigger jumps, go you. But unfortunately, that means for 99% of you watching this video, you're not that blessed. So what will happen for the rest of us? Weightlifting will basically make whatever mediocre or bad pattern we brought in stronger. And there is some argument to be made that a strong mediocre pattern is better than a weak mediocre pattern. And that honestly might be true, but I think that's missing the point. It's not really a way forward. Yes, you'll be 3% less mediocre. Yes, you might jump a bit further, but it's not fundamentally addressing the thing that matters. Your original movement pattern. And this is the thing that ultimately causes scaling. A good pattern scales well. Adding half a foot to a mediocre jump is not a significant improvement. I mean, it's okay, I guess, but it's not that interesting to me at least. So unless you're fundamentally improving your movement patterns, no amount of lifting heavier is going to make you a better athlete. So before I go on to how to improve your movement patterns, there is also an elephant in the room. And that is that bad and mediocre movement patterns when lifting weights really carry with them a high potential for injury. You're dealing with really big force levers on your ankles, knees, and spine, and you can really jank your shit up. I see way more people with weightlifting injuries than I'd like to. So back to learning these good movement patterns. What you fundamentally need for learning any skill is a low stress environment with low forces, low risk, and plenty of time to observe and feel what's going on in your body and integrate that information and learn from it. So does that sound like a weightlifting environment to you? Spoiler alert, it's not. We need to learn these patterns with just our regular old body and body weight. So next, I'm going to go into a little more detail what some of these patterns look like specifically. First, the squatting pattern and then the deadlifting pattern. Olympic lifts and bench press are also relevant, but I'm going to leave them out of this video. Otherwise, it will just go on forever. So in terms of squatting, there are some really important factors to consider. And if you've seen my videos before, this is going to sound pretty familiar. But generally, your spine needs to be straight and your hips need to track centrally as you move up and down through the movement. Think capital I shape with shoulders level, spine being the middle of the eye and the hips being the bottom of the eye. And today I'm going to go into this in a little more detail than I have previously, because in the real world, like doing parkour or jumps or whatever, it's not actually realistic or possible to expect you to maintain a perfect capital I spine. Because a lot of the time we aren't actually moving in perfectly straight lines. Keeping it perfectly symmetrical just isn't realistic. Unless, of course, we are actually moving in straight lines. When we aren't, we need to super compensate with more support in the opposite direction to that the movement would like to continue in. To maintain as much centrality, or at least 
supporting in the direction of centrality as possible. So let's say for an example, I'm landing a 360 jump. And when I land, my hips want to continue with that spinning motion. We need to counteract that spin internally with the rotational supporting forces in the opposite direction. This isn't literally central as our hips will move off center, but the effect is centralizing in that our support is bringing us back to a more neutral position. And most importantly, that twisting movement won't continue uncontrolled and unsupported. And if you watched my last video, you'll know why that's not a very good thing. Okay, back to regular squatting again. Now, in this case, we do want to be literally central, both for ideal muscle power. If we twist and move off center, some muscles will end up shorter and others end up longer, and this will disadvantage their functioning. And for avoiding twisting into joints unnecessarily, especially if that is an unsupported twist, which is probably the case. So let's practice looking at some non-straight squats. And today I'm going to give you a bunch of things you can specifically look for. One, look for the lines on the sides of people's necks. These give you a really good indication of where someone's neck is going. And this is really useful because your neck is just attached to your spine. If someone's neck is going to the left, it means that their spine is probably going to the left too. And watch out for a head that's going the opposite direction. So let's say the spine and neck are going right, but then the head on top of that can be going left. Two, look for more knees showing up on either side of the hip. If you can see more knees sticking out one side, this means either this leg is sticking out more to the side, or the entire hips themselves have shifted across, making one side of the leg more visible. Now, either of these is not ideal, but the hip shift is probably more likely. And this hip movement often goes with the accompanying spine movement we talked about before. So in this example here, what you'll often see is with hips that shift to the right, you'll have a spine and neck that shifts left. Now this definitely isn't always the case, but as an example of a fairly common pattern that shows up, it's really worth filming yourself from directly behind and frame by frame, pausing and drawing on these images to see what it is you are actually doing. In particular, pay attention to the frame at the bottom of the movement where you start to push up again. This is the most likely to be troublesome because it's the hardest position in the movement. This is when your muscles that you need for the movement are at their most stretched and it's the easiest to end up least central. Three, watch for collapsing ankles. These often pair with the hip deviation that I talked about before, and they tend to go into a spiral downwards. As the hips move across, the ankle on the left side often tends to collapse in as well. Now, fixing the hips and spine will often address a lot of this, but they also need to be paid attention to in their own right. Four, in terms of the forward and back element of this movement, when you start to run out of range of motion in your ankles, this is going to naturally shift your weight back more towards your heels. Think of the point just before your weight ends up all on your heels as your cutoff point for a safe range of motion. Throughout this movement, you want to keep weight in the balls of your feet throughout the whole thing. Okay, now for the deadlift pattern. There are really two ways of bending down. The squatty way, which is a lot more quads, and the deadlifty way, which is a lot more glutes and hamstrings. And deadlifts kind of make more sense to talk about in this weightlifting context, as they're a kind of specialized movement. So I'll talk about them mostly in this way. Firstly, people need to drive themselves through to upright using their glutes. And this is true of both squats and deadlifts, but more so for deadlifts. And instead, people use what they know how to use, their quads. And as a result, yes, something straightens, but the bar itself doesn't move upwards. They've just straightened their legs. They've generated the illusion of lifting weights. They've rearranged their body, but fundamentally nothing has changed. And your quads do help later on in this movement, but to initiate this movement, your glutes need to drive you to upright, kind of like unfolding a piece of paper. And you really need to feel them working. This isn't an abstract concept. This is a felt sense of my glutes are squeezing and pushing me to upright. And this is also really true on the eccentric, the lowering portion of this movement when you're putting the weight down. You need to reload those glutes as you're putting the weight down. And this might even be harder than the concentric phase to do. And it's really important, again, that this is a felt sensation. It's kind of like a combination of stretching plus loading as the weight comes down towards the ground. And this is again about preventing as much of this load as possible ending up in the spine. If you are lowering the weight and do feel that temptation to bend, this is why people encourage dropping the weight in deadlifts because it's a lot easier and safer to just let go of the weight than risking injuring your spine. And this links nicely onto the second tip 
for deadlifts, which is your spine can't be bending in this movement. It's got to be straight throughout the whole thing, especially your lower spine. Now, you might say, hey, Theo, there are some professional weightlifters who bend their spine when deadlifting. And that's great. But are you a professional weightlifter? I bet you aren't. So don't bother thinking about that or trying that. They're mostly bending through their upper thoracic spine, and it's very hard to distinguish this. So just like, yeah, straight spine. And this really links in to one of the more common areas where people feel pain when they're deadlifting, which is around their sacral or L4, L5 area. This almost always occurs in the lower parts of these movements, and it's mostly about these vertebrae moving around a lot more than they should be. And this is really because the bottom is the hardest part of this movement. Your spine is at its most disadvantaged angle for a lever, and the muscles you need to drive you up out of that position, your glutes, are at their most stretched, so it's the hardest for them to work. And then this is usually compounded by people's inflexibility through their hamstrings. People often can't actually get into a good starting position for this movement because their hamstrings are so inflexible. The safe, functional working range of motion for a person in this movement is how far you can bend down with a straight back. So in this example here, this person can safely bend to about here before their spine needs to bend and they have to compensate to get down to the bar. Whereas this person here can get all the way down to the bar without bending through a spine. And this is the kind of safe range. Wherever you can get to with a flat back is where you need to start this movement from. So if you can't make it all the way down to the bar, you need to put something underneath it to make it higher to begin with. So plates or boxes or whatever to make sure that you're lifting with your back straight from the very beginning. And this goes without saying, I'm sure, but you really need to master this before you even touch a bar with weights on it. And so three, if you have really got all of that very good, general things to keep in mind when you're lifting weight up off the ground. Before you even start to lift it, you need to generate the equivalent amount of tension in your body pushing you upwards so that when you engage and start to pull up, you've already got all of the tension and support you need to make this movement work. Like don't try to start to lift and then add tension. That's just snap city. And one of the tools you can help to do this is with intra-abdominal pressure which also helps decrease the introvertible forces around your discs. And this is why people wear those belts around their weight to try and increase the amount of pressure around their abdomen, basically. And so if you're doing parkour, you're probably not going to have a belt like this on. But the basic principle is you fill your diaphragm with air and then you squeeze really tight on it um, and try not to pass out. Four, in terms of the top of this movement, what happens when you get to the top? Please stop leaning back. I don't know where this idea really came from or what people think it's supposed to be achieving, but when you come up to the top of the movement, just come up to straight, get out of flexion, put your hips flat underneath you. There's no need to bend backwards. You don't get bonus points for doing a back bend holding 200 kgs. It's just pointless risk. And five, just generally related to this, stop taking your weight back entirely onto your heels when your butt moves back. For some reason, people think butt back equals weight on heels. Yes, you can have weight on your heels, but you also need to keep the balls of your feet on the ground whenever you're doing a movement like this. So even though you're moving backwards, keeping weight firmly in the balls of your feet. And the real practicality of these movements is being able to transfer these principles into parkour. So practicing and getting really good at them without a bar first is really what I'd recommend. And for this movement in particular, I'd really encourage people to be super conservative. There's a bit of controversy regarding how much this can snap your shit up if you're doing this wrong and herniated discs and all that, but I wouldn't worry about it. Just don't take risks. Don't be the one to find out. Play it safe. Now, enough about those two patterns. I think it's also worth mentioning that if your goal is really jumping further, the hip extension pattern is one of the crucial elements to this, and it's not really trained by either of these movements particularly well, and that will probably ultimately have a larger impact on your jump than either of these to some extent. So I'd recommend watching some of my other videos on that if you are interested in just the pure jumping further goal. Okay, so enough about those specific patterns. There are some other factors worth considering that are really relevant too. In parkour, body weight is king. Being physically heavier makes nearly every move in parkour harder because you have to move your own body weight for everything you're doing. So anything that can potentially cause you to gain weight needs to be seriously considered. Now, a true strength training program won't necessarily see you gaining that much mass. But with that said, a true strength training program is often also injury city because it encourages really low reps with really high weights. And that's the danger zone. 
And so if you do end up gaining weight through all your weightlifting, yes, your jumps will probably improve, but other aspects of your movement may really suffer. Your vaults, your flow, your transitions, bar stuff, like parkour is multidisciplinary, but if you really do only like jumps, go for it. Another thing worth considering as well is general training load. Like most people who like parkour train it about as much as they physically can train it, which means a lot of people's bodies are pretty maxed out a lot of the time. If you're adding weight training into your training schedule, this is a lot more load to manage and it needs to be carefully considered. You then need to allocate training and recovery time to weights and that's going to eat into your other parkour training time. So I guess that comes again into motivation, like what are you training for and what your priorities are. Like, would you rather learn some cool new skills or improve your transitions or potentially jump half a foot further? Because you're always making trade-offs when you're training. So after all that, would I recommend weightlifting to someone? And I think the really unfortunate, boring answer is that it depends. If you're a top level athlete, where jumping a little bit further is really important and a super desirable outcome for whatever it is you're doing, and you don't mind maybe potentially losing a bit of flow or something else, then yeah, go for it. However, if you're a beginner athlete with some mediocre or even bad movement patterns, I would say, yep, yeah, avoid it, at least until you've got those on lock. And that's something that can take quite a long time to acquire. Some of these patterns are not just things you can pick up overnight. And I guess everyone else is somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. And I think you really need to think about what it is you're training for, what's important to you and what outcomes you'd like. But with all that said, I do actually think the answer is moving better, not moving stronger. I see strength as a side effect of moving well and not the other way around. I think a lot of people get very outcome focused and think if they're moving bigger weights, their movement will improve, but I really don't think that's the case at all. Focus on moving well and the strength will follow. Some of the best athletes out there don't lift weights at all. A great example of this is Kadori. He's an incredible athlete, he's built, and he's not someone that regularly lifts weights. And if you are going to lift weights, I really encourage caution, progressing very slowly, form checking like a madman, and really taking care of your body. You've only got one. Okay, that's all for this week, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more content in the future at some point. Peace out.